Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My time is about half up. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm struggling slightly to try to figure out how to truncate my message. But I want to sort of give you a sense that we need to be worried, that we need to worry in particular about what if we get it wrong. We have to think through these challenges of innovation, this invitation to change a field, with our humility intact. And in general, people tend to fail to do that when they have to muster their courage and commit themselves to an uncertain future. Okay? So let's build on that excellent set of observations that Jim Hodge gave us and bring Leo back up for another visit, OK? He was born 557 years ago on April 15th, and he is still dead. Leonardo da Vinci was so incredibly talented that had there been Nobel Prizes when he was alive, the man would have cleaned up every category. There are many people who believe, I'm one of them willing to entertain the theory, that he in fact descended from another planet. That's how extraordinarily unusual he was in his day. Leonardo da Vinci was so skilled that he could draw a picture of a baby that would bring tears to your eyes. He was so skilled with his artistry that his very first lesson with one of the best art teachers in, in uh, Italy at the time that he was just a young lad caused the art teacher to quit on the spot. In his spare time, he'd started thinking about things like proportion. So in the evening, he would just say, well, you know, if I measure myself from fingertip to fingertip, it's going to predict my height within what it turns out to be, a, you know, one or two percent. And yet, I want to talk to you about when Leonardo da Vinci, this extraordinary individual, got it wrong. You see, in those days, the Medicis, who we heard about from Jim, would be landowners. And the landowners had to protect all their villagers by putting them behind a fortress wall. And they would hire individuals to protect those villagers from marauders. These individuals were mercenaries. And what Leonardo da Vinci did, again, in his spare time, was offer to be sort of, you know, a defense contractor. And he offered, in particular, to sell a variety of different technologies. What you see here, up at the top, are machine guns, helicopters, parachutes, and at the bottom, an early generation tank. And the reason this was so crucial at the time, because those pesky French were showing up in Italy and really ravaging these extraordinary fortresses. What caused the French to do this? Well, a transformation, to borrow a phrase from, the, uh, from, from our conference this week. What the French did is they created these very portable, very accurate, lightweight cast cannons. Only the French would filigree them to that degree with all the decorations on the barrel. But the way they were conducting their warfare was to roll them up to the corner of wooden fortresses, blast you know, cannonballs over the wall, start a fire, wait for the people to come out and slaughter them. Now, if you're a mercenary, and this is the option where you're supposed to fight against this battle in a transformational change, I think you would prefer not to. You stay inside, and you have another plate of pasta. This turned out to be a problem. Leonardo da Vinci's solutions were conventional warfare. They took the moment of the day and they said, let's see if we can't use special weapons and tactics. How many of you get the occasional impression that as we try to fix or repair or change or layer new things on top of what we were properly told yesterday by both Denny Cortez and by Clayton Christensen is really not a system? How many of you get the instinct that sometimes we make mistakes by layering it, festooning it with additional degrees of complexity? Because if that's your instinct, trust that instinct. You see, the answer, it turned out, inside of the Italian world, 
took another 40 years after Leonardo da Vinci died to actually solve. And it turned out to require a really fundamental shift in the system. What you see in the lower right is the new design of the ways in which the villagers learned to live. There were no blind spots. The villagers were way in the middle, and you could put skilled archers out on the points. It made the cannons irrelevant. And more to the point, what the Medici family learned to do was to gather people up and to create the beginnings of participative democracy, to get people engaged, as we learned from Pat Garrity this morning, in creating the life that they want to have, giving them the freedom and the invitation to do that, and, and specifically trying to address new ways to um, get a standing army and people actively participating in the ways that they would live as members of a community and members of, of, a, uh, of a village. This is our little parable to begin a conversation for the next few minutes about how sometimes things change. We are all of us properly alarmed about the rising costs of health care. When you look at the predictions, it is out of control. And specifically, when you look at it as a percentage of GDP, you can see that in 2007, it's at 16.2% of GDP, rising in 2018, not so very long from now, to more than 20% of our gross domestic product. No civilization has ever been able to tolerate this level of cost. This is why you hear this ridiculous phrase that only a bureaucrat could love, that we have to bend the curve. Okay? And my invitation to you is to think about how we're going to do that for real, not just by, as I said earlier, festooning the non-system we have with additional layers of complexity. This is now, the thing that matters is that future time where we're going to actually make a series of choices. Now, I always like to imagine the Mayo brothers having conversations about this. One of the things that Mayo enjoys is this extraordinary gift of a brilliant system two individuals, and you can imagine that they're proud of themselves. So, so, uh, uh, so Will says to Charlie, you know, we built the Mayo model of care. But you know what I think the response would be today, appropriately, is, yeah, bro, but it's easier to build breakthroughs from scratch. It's much harder when you've got a system, you have to change it, you have to figure out how to coexist with it. This is harder than we know, more problematic than we believe, it will take longer and it will be plagued with uncertainties and difficulties. If Leonardo da Vinci gets it wrong sometimes, can't we imagine that we might too? And how do we think about that? How do we hold on to that? Well, I'm going to offer up for your consideration that there's four fundamental transformations going on and they have to be tightly linked together. The first one is not your problem. It belongs to the United States of America, and it's going to require a foundational transformation, and it appears to be in the works. The AHA is presently estimating, and their lobbyists are almost always right about these predictions, that the bill will pass on December 23rd of this year, just before Congress goes home for Christmas. The bill will probably be flawed in any number of ways, but the important thing is it will be some kind of transformation. The beginnings of something that we can pick over time. I'll talk about that in a moment, but then I'm going to quickly touch on three major transformational platforms that are being developed here at Mayo, directed by the Center for Innovation, and produced in a way that has the power to radically alter the way we think about, conduct, and manage care going forward. Okay? Now, as we all know, there are plenty of people with great advice about how to change the system. We heard yesterday uh, from uh, Dr. Teesberg, who is, of course, um, a co-author of that uh, important book with my partner at Monitor, Michael Porter. We also were favored with uh, one of the greatest thinkers in the world about innovation, Clayton Christensen. We haven't heard yet from T.R. Reid. He also has done a recent terrific analysis of four systems and how they changed pointing out that America has all four systems layered on top of each other in a cat's breakfast of, of, uh, of unholy choices. We will hear later from Tim Brown today, who will talk to us about other ways in which these kinds of changes can get granular, specific, and, and, uh, and impressive. 
But what we do here, broadly, is these principles. Fundamental fairness, some way of getting access for all, insurance systems and rules, complexity and cost management shifts, and some wild cards like the ability to have a single payer public option or tort reform. I don't know if anyone else gets a sort of vague and strange sense. When you walk from here back to Mayo and you pass, for instance, the Suck Law Firm, uh, you know, it just, I've been trying to figure out how exactly I feel about that. I, I vaguely imagine that there are lawyers in there whose whole career it is to just harass um, doctors at Mayo and Hoover their wallets. But I'm hoping that that's just, just you know, my, my overactive imagination. Um, but surely tort reform would be a plus among these other things. What we know is that changing entire fields happens all the time. But the issue is it either changes slowly and badly, or occasionally it can change in elegant and crisper and faster and more disciplined ways. These are the things that I want us to share. By the way, those of you interested in these notes, I posted them for you on a secure website, which I will reveal at the end, okay? So you don't have to follow so much. But think about it looking backwards. These things are always easier to spot looking backwards than they are looking forward. So stand with me for a moment and look backwards. There are massive changes in how we buy books, in how we get money, in how we stay in touch with one another, how we buy music, and how we rent movies, how we find a place to live or some furniture to put in it, how we get information. These things are all now easy to see. None of them were easy to predict at the moment that these things were created. None of them. And that gives us a perspective that complicated systems do indeed change all the time, and we should take some comfort in knowing that these changes occur. Now, I don't have time to go over a model in any sort of detail at all, but I am here to hypothecate for you, or at least point out, that the, the ways that those systems change are either kind of loose, slow, complicated, and layered, which is what we're having right now in the so-called healthcare system, or they can be on the opposite end of the spectrum, deeply integrated, sophisticated, and consciously catalyzed in a way that causes much more rapid change. Left to the devices of the industry, what we will get is things mostly on the left, almost nothing on the right. And that will be a mistake, and it will not allow us to rise to this occasion. There are plenty of examples of things that were catalysts of radical change. This is an example of what we live with all the time when what we have is loose, slow, painful systems. Those of you that travel internationally understand that half of your luggage is taken up with the nonsense you have to haul so that the stuff you're used to using everywhere that you need to go will actually function. This is silly and annoying and normal. Okay? <clears throat> Something in the middle is the idea of containerized shipping. One of the most incredible innovations in the history of the world all great innovations begin by focusing on something that doesn't make any sense anymore and is way past its sell-by date. In this case, it was focused on handling things one at a time when you move them from a ship to a, to a uh, truck or something else. Creating the cargo containers, the box as they're called, is what has allowed globalization to actually occur in the world, massively increasing the total amount of port handling and leading to lots of downstream innovations that are surprising. People build skyscrapers with these things. They build full-scale data centers. They build coffee shops that they can drop anywhere in the world conveniently. Let's take one that's much more um, sort of advanced than that. Very few people point, notice this when they first pay attention to Amazon, but there's a little arrow that connects the A to the Z. It's always been there, and you've probably never noticed. Right from the beginning, Amazon had an ambition, ladies and gentlemen, to sell you everything. What did they focus on first? Books. Why? Because they're fundamentally stupid how they're sold, OK? Here's the problem for a bookstore owner. You probably, like me, love bookstores. I could spend days in bookstores if they didn't close them at night. The problem for a bookstore owner is there's about four or $500,000 worth of inventory. And what do you think the odds are that somebody's going to show up and ask for that book way up there on the top, way over on the left this month? 
That's why it's a crummy business and easily attacked. What they did at Amazon is they learned to create very low friction way to purchase. How many of you have one-click purchasing turned on on a computer near you? You'll discover, as I did, that this is a very, very unfortunate thing to have turned on <laughs> because it massively streamlines your ability to purchase stuff. And it turns out to be bad for you, OK? But here's the thing. By being easier to do business with than anyone else, Amazon first learned to do extraordinary fulfillment for lots of other players. And now it's one-stop shopping for people that want to have a way to get their goods through the internet to individuals you don't even notice very often when the things are coming from someplace other than Amazon. But it's a high percentage of the time. Sometimes things like this end up transforming industries altogether. So things can be simple, they can be hard, and here at Mayo, there's an extraordinary team led by Nick and Barb and uh, Genrico, who we've been hearing from, and what they're trying to do, of course, is to give us some ways to think about reinventing the Mayo model of care and what Mayo does for a living. What's extraordinarily important about this is we are all gratified, certainly I am, that President Obama has been able to cite the Mayo Clinic in many of his speeches as something that he admires, an institution that he thinks is showing us the way. We have a special burden to try to reinvent that and imagine it altogether differently. And so I'm going to take us through three basic ways to build on the foundation of change that we hope will be coming sometime soon from the United States you know, um, Congress. So that foundation we have no control over. We can influence ever, ever so slightly. We advise on it, certainly Denny Cortez's opinions and several other of our lobbyists, uh, experts at Mayo, are able to shape it as best we can, especially in partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. Let's hope we get a rational, important system. But what we can control, what we owe it to each other, what we owe to our patients, what we owe to the world, is a transformation in these basic categories. We do have to pay attention, as Roy points out to us, to our information convergence. It's happening all around. The well is only one example amongst many. A prediction and prevention revolution and an integrated wellness revolution. Let's take each of those and do them one slide at a time. Led by Dr. Chowdhury, the Mayo Clinic co connection is an example of information intensivity and convergence and theory and, and application. What uh, Dr. Rajiv Chowdhury is doing is trying to create these specialty e-consults which will allow the power of Mayo Clinic to be available anywhere, anytime, with no loss of quality compared to the kinds of things that we're able to do when we're, um, when we're helping people face-to-face, patient-centered medical homes, health information management systems. And what we learned yesterday is the completely unattended revolution that's so desperately needed um, I thought introduced so well by Denny Cortese and the science of healthcare delivery. These are things that need to come together to bring more knowledge, more precision, and more care. A second revolution is in prediction and prevention, the ability to tailor things to individuals. Much of this is work that will take many years, even decades, to pay off, but we see a rather um, extraordinary transformation from disease to health. You also heard a similar thing being hinted at by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, thanks to Pat's uh, thoughtful presentation this morning. And then finally, led by Kerry Olson, with uh, Michael Brennan also helping to create new forms of destination care, is the idea that Mayo can be, should be, must become a lifelong partner in the health of individuals, especially if we can learn to uh, you know, use great family histories and great personal records, wellness and coaching, and unparalleled destination experiences to try to help individuals have more awareness of their family condition, their personal condition, and do things to avoid the problems that they're most likely to suffer from. I'm going to sum up because I think you've earned a break. Sometimes things change. They all categories, industries, they always change over time, ladies and gentlemen. The question is, will we, we be conscious about it? Will we be systematic about it? Will we catalyze it in, in clear ways? 
One thing that we all need to recognize is that healthcare is different in a series of ways. It's complicated. It's confusing. There are people who are predisposed to never change what they do once they learn that it works well and saves patients. Innovation happens in this field more slowly and tends to happen more in isolation than in ways that you see in other industries. Hospital systems, delivery systems generally, may not be quick to notice or adopt best practices even once there is uh, evidence of their superiority. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Practitioners often have different goals and different needs than patients. Fortunately, there seems to be less resistance to these kinds of insights and ideas at Mayo than there are at other places. What we know, do know, though, is that any multi-system like this is complex and it exists in a web of interdependencies, this makes change inherently slow and costly and layered and hard to foster. Sometimes things change, not always with the swiftness and certainty that we need. What I'm specifically urging us to do is to embrace, in the way that has been set in motion by the Center for Innovation and deeply supported by all of the leaders of uh, Mayo Clinic, the kind of courage, confidence, discipline, and humility that makes a difference. A hundred years after Leonardo da Vinci died, there was a pretty interesting com you know, observation made by Machiavelli. He said, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. What he's saying is it's hard to be a revolutionary. It's hard to change everything all at once. And he points out something that should be obvious but often is not. The reformer has enemies in all who profit from the old order and only the lukewarm defenders and those who would profit from the new order. This is what we are seeing exactly now in the ridiculous, nonsensical, and hysterical resistance to health care reinvention in our nation's capital and all across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, we owe it to one another to bring discipline, to bring courage, to bring curiosity, and yes, humility to these important tasks. Thank you very much. Larry, thank you. As always, I'm in awe. Oh, oh website. Oh, can we? You went by it. Back up, please, because I'm showing it. You're just not seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Clientweb.doblin.com. Everybody in this room should be savvy enough to know you never have to type that stupid HTTP thing. Just please don't start with triple W. Log in as Mayo Space Clinic. Password with an initial cap is transform. That'll get you the notes. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you, Larry.